great pleasure to introduce David Arrell, our today's speaker, the Edward Lovelace uh, Lecture Series. Um, David Arrell is uh, the th one of the things that makes him the most special. He is one of the very, very few computer scientists that has seen me without a master. The only. No, I actually found a couple of others, what but not, not active computer scientists. So the what only act, you, hmm? you also, Michael, there are about three or four people. I mean, it's, very, it's a very small crowd, very exclusive crowd to, to the crowd of the people who have known Moshe Vardy without the uh, masters. But, uh, I mean, David has been working, I've known David now for oh, 40 years, my goodness, it's a long time. And uh, his, his whole career was really, uh, in some sense, one can say it's about models for computation. And uh, in the early days, it was uh, started with uh, looking at, uh, trying to analyze uh, the behavior of programs. And then he went on from then, and he laid the kind of foundations for what does it mean for database queries to be computable. And then I would say probably for the last now, what, 30 years, was taking models of computation that really come from very uh, theoretical consideration where we look at uh, non-determinism, which we can interpret existentially or universally, Moshe. and actually applying it. Are you talking about this? No, I'm giving yeah. a talk today, okay. so. <laughs> you have time. And applying it to real life problems. So this is really, a, a, to me, a spanning all the way from very theoretical consideration to very practical considerations, David Arell. So uh, this is not personally, but I like Moshe's mustache very much. <laughs> uh, I just remember that my older brother, some of you may know him, Menachem Fish, he has a beard, and he, he's had a beard since he was 10, I don't know, when he had started. <laughs> and I always say to him, keep it on, the less we see of your face, the better. <laughs> so, um, um, and, and linking up to what Moshe said at the end, so I, I'm really happy to, to give this talk. I prepared it out of some, some other talk I gave on touring a couple of years ago, a few times. But the reason I'm going to enjoy myself at least is because I'm going to go back to the theory I used to do, uh, which I stopped doing. The last theorem I proved as a theorem uh, it was in 1991, so that's 25 years ago almost. And I'm going to show it to you today, and, um, and I'm going to prove it to you today. So, uh, so beware. Uh, so for me, this is, uh, this is going to be fun. But I do want to say a few things about Turing first. Um, and, and talk about some of the things that he did, and then gradually. Um, so I'd also like to dedicate this uh, lecture to Ashok Chandra. And Moshe knows him very well, Yuri knows him very well, other people, uh, amazing guy, and uh, he passed away last year uh, at a tragically young age. Um, so here we see a, a dwarf standing on the shoulders of a giant, um, and uh, this, uh, this uh, saying is attributed to Isaac Newton. If I have seen further, it's because I stand on the shoulders of a giant. And it's true that uh, Newton wrote this, maybe even said it, uh, but he is not the originator of this aphorism. And if you don't take anything away from this lecture, except for one thing, I would really recommend that you read this book. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful book written by one of the, um, uh, I think, greatest uh, sociologist of the 20th century, Robert K. Milton. It's called On the Shoulders of Giants. And the fans of this book, there's a whole following, uh, uh, use OTSOG as the acronym, OTSOG. Um, it's, it's a little bit like Umberto Eco's novels. Uh, so it's, like a, it's almost like a mystery story, but it's not a novel. It's about uh, uh, digging for the origins of this uh, aphorism. And he finds it goes hundreds of years before Newton. It appears in art and, and um, sculpture and other sorts of So the giant, of course, in this story is, uh, is Turing, so very, very briefly. I, 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 there are some things in this lecture that uh, um, I'm taking the chance that uh, most of you do know about, but nevertheless. So Alan Turing, uh, in, in the eyes of many of us, the indisputable father of computer science, there are other fathers of computers and, and, and information theory, but uh, he is the father of computer science. And, I'm going to try not to exaggerate too much. I, I think he can almost be said to be the Mozart of computing, died at a young age, and left an incredibly brilliant and versatile uh, legacy. And uh, as, as in such cases, we're always uh, in such cases left with the question of what, what he would have achieved if he had been with us for another 20 or 30 years. 
Uh, so now there are, I have three slides, very, very superficially and briefly, uh, shining a light on three different kinds of things that uh, the Turing was able to do. And in each slide, there is a little bit of a contrast. So, so Turing invented the notion of universality of computation, and he conceived of uh, one, at least, of the simplest, all-powerful models of computation, the Turing machines. But on the other hand, he also worked on the design of some of the most complex machines of, uh, of his time, so the simple and the complex. Um, he proved, as you know, and I'll, I'll, we'll get to this, that there are many things that computers cannot do, provably cannot do, and the exclamation mark here, of course, is because in the mid-1930s, there weren't really um, uh, general purpose computers, so to be able to establish the ultimate limits, uh, some of the limits uh, at that time, uh, was an amazing achievement. He wasn't the only person uh, in that period, of course, or others. But he also taught us that there are some amazing things that computers can do, so he was interested in the bad news and in the good news um, at the same time. Um, many people are not aware of the fact that Turing also did uh, pioneering work on the modeling of biology, um, especially uh, uh, morphogenesis. Sorry, it's one of our group members who's attending the lecture from home because she's sick, so, I'm, so please continue. So he was interested in biology in general and living things, but as we all know, he was, me, he was also interested in the, in the human side of, com of computers and um, in whether computers can exhibit human-like intelligence and the Turing test and so and here is my uh, outrageous statement. I think that Turing will become recognized not just as the father of, or one of the fathers of computation, but uh, in the future as one of the most important thinkers, scientists of all time. And I think his name should be and maybe will be mentioned along uh, other names such as Galileo, Einstein, Darwin, and so on. And now to us, we are the dwarfs, many of us who feel they are standing on the shoulders of the giant, <coughs> and so you can see a little bit further because, because of that. And many of us feel that a lot of our research has its roots in Turing's work. And what I'm going to do today, I'm going to concentrate on computability, which is uh, one, of, uh, uh, one of Turing's most uh, important contributions to the foundations of computing. And, uh, and, and I'll kind of <coughs> gradually flow into the way it impacted parts of my own research. And as I said, I like this stuff because I did it in the past, I don't do it anymore, and it's a pleasure to be able to uh, find an opportunity to talk about it. So, of course, the topic is computability. I won't talk about uh, Turing's modeling of biology. I won't talk about uh, um, uh, the machines he built. We'll definitely not talk about cryptography in the Second World War. Um, so, I'll concentrate on these most fundamental things. And now there will be a few slides. <coughs> which um, I apologize, they might be a little bit too simple for m many of you, but I think it will get us into the... Uh... So we already said uh, computability, universal computing and non-solvability, and together with other people at the time, such as uh, Gödel, of course, and, and uh, Church and Post, uh, uh, established the absolute limits of computing. And I'm going to talk today about uh, three modest follow-ups, computability on finite structures, you can see the years these things were done, computability on infinite recursive structures, and work on high non-solvability. And I guess this gets us to 1991. So I'd like to introduce this, this story of what computers cannot do uh, with this uh, wonderful uh, quotation from, uh, so this is uh, 30 years ago, right, if I count correctly. Now this quotation is not from uh, a person off the street. This is from the editor-in-chief of a particular software magazine. And that person says, put the right kind of software into a computer, and it, the software, the computer, will do whatever you want it to. There may be limits on what you can do with the machines, but there are no limits on what you can do with the software. And um, I grew up in England for the first seven years of my life, and my parents told me to be polite and never say nasty words, so I will not say, Bullshit. Um, I, I won't say bullshit about this, but it is. Uh, now, this is this is wrong 
uh, not because um, not because this person um, didn't read some paper or didn't know about some developments he should have known about. This person does not uh, know anything about the fundamental um, basis of his own profession. It's a little bit like a physicist not knowing about gravity, for example. <coughs> so when you want a problem solved on a computer and you, you ask someone to do it for you and they're not able to, you usually get all kinds of excuses such as I'm not uh, rich enough, I don't have enough money, if I did I'd buy a better computer and then I could solve it. Uh, I don't have enough time, it's a very lengthy computation, I'm not young enough. Uh, and the usual excuse is I, I can't find a solution, I'm not smart enough, maybe someone else will. So problem is you don't know how to solve problems that you do know how to solve. Uh, but that's not the interesting distinction. The interesting distinction is between problems that are solvable, if it's a decision problem with a yes no answer, we call them decidable, uh, versus problems that are unsolvable. And up here we will put things, if, if there are any, uh, which we can prove uh, do not have solutions by algorithms running on, on computers. There's a lot of issues that have to be talked about here. I'm sure you're all aware of them. What exactly, uh, how do you define a computer, how do you define an algorithm? Uh, but the interesting thing is that this line is extremely robust. It doesn't really matter um, what computer you want to think about, what kind of programming language or methodology you want to talk about, what kind of hardware or software. Um, given enough time, space, uh, and, and other resources that are needed, um, the class of things that can be solved uh, and the class of things that cannot be solved are extremely robust. So this line is completely insensitive. Anything you can do, I can do. Anything I cannot do, you cannot do either uh, in general. And if you want, this is, in my humble opinion, the most fundamental fact in all of computation, that the class of things that can be solved is extremely robust. Um, and this is due to Church and Turing and other people in various guises. Uh, it's uh, called the Turing thesis, the Church Turing thesis. And again, remarkably, this thesis was implicitly put forward by these people and others in the mid-1930s. Incredible because, again, we had no real computers then. And there isn't even a sliver of evidence that we should change this definition of what can and cannot be done. Uh, the way I like to put this thesis is all computers, all programming languages are equal. So if uh, I like my language and you like your language and I like to work with uh, Windows and you like to work with Apple, this is all fine, but in principle, um, there's no actual difference in terms. So there's differences in, in running time, you know, memory and all kinds of other measures of complexity, but we won't get into that here. <coughs> and I'd like to give you what I uh, uh, really like uh, uh, to, to use as the simplest example um, uh, for, for a kind of a general audience of a problem that's unsolvable, uh, I like to use timing problems or domino problems which were introduced by Wang. Um, and for the sake of this little story here, so imagine you want to tile your living room and you go down Chov Emek uh, or wherever and there are some tiling shops or a talpiot and, um, and you walk into one of these shops and instead of tiles with butterflies and fish and flowers, the tiles all look like this. There are several different types of tiles but they all have uh, two diagonals uh, dividing it into quarters and each quarter is colored with some color, can be the same color, different colors. Um, and th there's another little uh, issue which is that he will not sell you, and by the way there's enough copies of each of the types of tiles that are in the store, you can, you can get you as many as you want, but there's a finite number of types. And uh, the other thing is you have to sign a contract uh, if you buy these from him, uh, with two clauses. One is not very important, it just makes the presentation a little easier, and that is, you're not allowed to turn them around. If that's the way it looks, so the green always has to be on top, <coughs> and the red, <coughs> the red on the left, etc. But the other clause is important, and that is that whenever you use the, these tiles to tile, the touching sides uh, on any two tiles have to be identical. So above this tile, you have to put a tile which has a green part on the bottom. Let me give you now a little example. Suppose you walk into the store and, and, and the questions that we want to ask is can you tile this living room or a large living room or the entire world with these tile types? And suppose these are the only three types of tiles and if I gave you a piece of paper in a, a couple of minutes time you could probably easily figure out that these three types of tiles can tile the entire uh, infinite plane in all directions. Uh, you know, just look here, I'm only using these three types. The colors always match and they're all in the same direction. And you can see the periodicity of this. If you want to prove, you prove by induction. You can extend this tiling in all directions. 
So the answer to the question of whether you can tile, for example, any size living room with these three types of tiles, the answer is yes. But if we make a small change here and we switch the colors at the bottom of two and three, <coughs> this one should be outside here, then it's also pretty easy to show that you cannot tile even a very small living room. Uh, and the proof is as follows. Um, if you can, so it's by contradiction, then I claim tile three must appear somewhere. Because if it does not appear, so which one appears? This guy appears, it has green on its left, so to its left you have to put something with green on its right, so three has to appear. Mm -hmm. So if two does not appear and three does not appear, only one, then above one you have to put something with green on the bottom, uh, so two appears. So this is, this, is, this is easy. And then if three must appear, let's put it somewhere, let's put it here. Below it we have to put a tile with the blue on the top, so it's again another copy of three. Then we have these two greens on the right, and to their right, the only thing we can put is tile number two, uh, and then you get a mismatch. So it's a simple proof. The point of these two slides was not uh, either of these two examples. Of course, the first one, the answer was yes. The second one, the answer was no. We, in computer science and algorithmics, were not interested in particular riddles. This is a nice little puzzle, maybe. We're interested in the general question, which is, can you decide when the answer is yes versus when the answer is no in general. So what we want is, it's called the basic unbounded tiling or domino problem. You're given a finite set of tile types, 17, and you're given descriptions of the four colors on each of these 17 types of tiles. And all we want is to build a program or build a machine or, or, or design a chip. And all it has to do, don't give me examples, don't give me a proof, just say yes or no. Yes, if these types of tiles can size, uh, uh, tile any sized living room, and no, um, if they can't. And by the way, just uh, if you want a little homework assignment, which is cute, this question is equivalent to the question of whether you can tile the entire infinite plane. In one direction, it's obvious. If you can tile the entire infinite plane, you can tile any sized living room. The other direction is not quite obvious, but it's true, and it's a nice little exercise. It, 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 for here, it doesn't really matter which version uh, you take. And, uh, of choice. and so, no, 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 no. Kenning's lemma. Kenning's lemma. lemma. Um, weak, weak Kenning's lemma. Moshe always did his homework very fast. I remember from our undergraduate days. Um, and this is not Turing. It's Wang. But I can I can tell you that the proof that this is undecidable essentially uh, is based on Turing's halting problem, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, and this problem is undecidable. When I give these kinds of talks to general audiences, I almost get up on the table and jump up and down because people do not know anything about problems that cannot be solved and they think anything in principle, like our friend from Time Magazine, can be solved on a computer, then this is an example of something that's provably not solvable. If you limit the maximum size of the living room or the maximum number of tile types and so on, yes, but in general, you cannot decide this. So this is an inherent provable impossibility. I always like to insert at least one nice little clip into, into such talks. So here is an apparent impossibility that can often be cleverly overcome. And I hope the, uh, the audio works here. Maybe some of you have seen, have seen this before. Chinese checkers. What happened to the audio? The better the Hashman, the more. Ah, it's not possible. No, no, not possible. Possible, but probably. Oh, <laughs> so that was just a little detour. So now, now I'm getting to something a little, a little uh, uh, different. And uh, so some people they see, say, the tiling problem. They say, well, I mean, what's the 
What's the big deal? Of course it cannot be computed because to say no, these tiles cannot tile any size living room. All you have to do is give me a certain size living room and show that all the possible combinations of these tiles cannot tile, which is a finite process. But to say yes, it can, you apparently have to check infinitely many things, so the problem is unbounded and, and therefore it's undecidable. So I don't think there's anyone here in this room who has to be told that that's not a proof of anything, but maybe the intuition is right. Something that looks unbounded, um, well, is, is undecidable, you, you just have to prove it, and not so. So I think this example shows very sharply that uh, a, a problem that looks unbounded doesn't necessarily have to be undecidable, sometimes quite the opposite. So let's talk about a slightly different problem. Same types of tiles, same finite number, same guy uh, in Talpiot. But now the question is not whether you can tile a living room or the whole world. In addition, you're given two points, P and Q, and you want to know if you can form a domino snake from P to Q, where, again, you have to have at least one touching edge and the, and the colors have to, uh, have to uh, match. So now I'm asking you, those of you who are not familiar with these results, um, what do you say about this? Is this decidable or undecidable? Are you given the P and Q where, where they are? Or you, you fix them. So the input is the finite set of tile types and two points. Just the two, yeah, the and two, the, the two points are, 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 their location is fixed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You tell, you're, you're exactly. I give you the two points in the plane, <coughs> and, and that's one instance of the problem, and yeah. you have to say yes or no. Mm -hmm. So in terms of boundedness, this is obviously unbounded, because the snake, if there is a snake, you don't know how to bound where it can go. It might go arbitrarily far and then come back to you. So it looks like an unbounded uh, question, and therefore it should be undecidable. The facts about this are quite remarkable. Um, here they are. So this is, so this is so I'm getting to see what this was done a little later than 91, by the way. Um, so this is undecidable in the positive half plane. So for example, if I draw a line down here, and, and I want to know whether you can tell from P to Q without leaving this, this semi-plane, the answer is no, this is undecidable. But if it's more unbounded, then the, the, the snake can go anywhere, the problem is decidable. And this is a very non-trivial uh, uh, result. Not only that, we were later able to show that even if you just take one single point away, so you're given three points, P, Q, and R, and you want to know whether there's a snake going from P to Q, can go anywhere except go through R, the problem again is undecidable. So beware um, of saying, oh, it looks unbounded, therefore uh, it's not computer. So this now is the halting problem, and th this is really uh, Turing. Uh, so I think you must be familiar with this problem, but just very briefly. So here's a, here's a little program, if x equals one, stop, otherwise decrease by one and go back. Uh, it's very easy to see that this program halts exactly on all the positive integers. It does not halt on 17 and a half. It does not halt on minus 17. It does not Hold on pi or on e. Dave, uh, so let's stick one comment. Yeah, sure. When you say tile the whole world, the whole world better be not spherical. Yeah, I, I meant <laughs> I meant an infinite plane. Because yes, it, sure. if you will, nothing will tile. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so this is a very this is a very easy program to uh, to analyze in terms of its halting set. Uh, here's something that looks uh, just a tiny little bit more complicated, and let's now just stick to the positive integers. If x equals 1, stop. If it's even, divided by 2. Otherwise, multiply by 3 plus 1. How many people are familiar with the 3x plus 1 problem? Um, and this is an innocent looking program, but no one knows whether it indeed halts on all the positive integers or not. This is an open problem, but it's an open problem in number theory. And with all due respect, the yeshkavod, as we say in Hebrew, we are not interested in a particular question in number theory. We're interested in the general question which is, despite the fact that this is a trivial example, this is a very difficult example, we're interested in the general question of can we solve the halting problem in its general form, which is, you're given a program in some pre-agreed upon programming language, you're given an input x in some pre-agreed upon uh, um, um, uh, manner of, of, of writing down inputs, and all we want is a yes or a no. Yes, if, had we run program p on input x, it would have halted, no if it uh, if it wouldn't have. And again, for, for a, for a non-professional audience, one here must make the point that simply to build W by simulation, by taking P and running it on X, uh, and waiting, this won't work, because if it halts, it halts, and you say yes, you are, you are W. 
But if it does not hold after three years and you give up, uh, you might be making a mistake saying, no, uh, it would have halted in another split second. And it was Turing who proved that there's no uh, way to solve this problem. The halting problem is undecidable. And uh, I think uh, ingenious maybe is a slight, uh, slight uh, uh, overkill here, but it's, it's, a, it's a clever diagonalization argument that uh, rests on the ideas uh, that uh, Kant already had uh, in the past. And I'll, I'll prove this to you very, very briefly. But what many people, even within computer science, are, uh, in my opinion, sadly unaware of is the following, which is Rice's theorem in the 1960s, which is not only is halting undecidable and equivalence undecidable and other things, but nothing is decidable about computation. And I know this sounds uh, <coughs> cannot be true. When I say nothing is decidable, any problem that doesn't have a trivial yes or trivial no answer in all cases, or is, is dependent, say, on the syntax. Does this program have 100 lines, uh, or is my program longer than Moshe's? This can be decided because it doesn't have anything to do with the behavior or the function computed by the program, just with its syntax. Anything, any question that has to do with the function computed by a program, which is invariant to the syntax, uh, is undecidable. And if you haven't heard of this, uh, it's a remarkable fact. It means that in our profession, I'm a computer scientist, we are the quintessential example of the barefoot Cobbler. No. We cannot compute anything about our profession, which is computation. And the proof That's of why this. I don't tell it to other people. I tell it to anyone. Um, the, the, the proof of this is subtle, uh, but it really rests very strongly on, on Turing's original uh, argument. Um, let, me, let me just briefly show you how I like to prove the halting problem undecidable. And again, so we're, we're standing on Turing's shoulders, but it's nice to see this proof by, almost by picture. So let's assume the halting problem is decidable. So we do have an algorithm or program in this language, uh, accepting a program and an input saying yes if P on Q halts, and saying no if P on Q does not halt. What we're going to do is we're going to construct a new program, call it R. And what R does, it takes just one input. A program P doesn't take anything else, just a program, and it makes two copies of it, and it hands these two copies to the assumed to exist W, um, uh, and, and then, then, then I, I am R, right? I wait for W over here to, to halt and give its answer. If it says yes, I enter <coughs> into an infinite loop artificially, and if it says no, I immediately halt. There's nothing wrong with this construction, it can be done in any language uh, with sufficient memory to make a copy of the inputs. <coughs> now what we're going to do is we're going to run R on itself. So we're going to take this program, and the program we're going to give it for breakfast is the R program itself. And so what it will do, it will make two copies of R, and then it will either say yes and enter an infinite loop. Uh, I'm sorry, it won't say yes. If W says yes, it will enter an infinite loop. W says no, it halts. This is the way we built R. However, this is impossible. There's an inherent contradiction here because what this means, what does it mean to run R on R? <coughs> w runs its left-hand input on its second-hand input and says whether this would have halted. So the question being asked here is whether R applied to R would halt. And if it says yes, it would halt, but then we get into an infinite loop, which means that R applied to R does not halt. But if R applied to R does not halt, what we do here is we do halt. And that means that on the assumption that R applied to R does not halt, we halt. And again, that's a contradiction. None of the possibilities is possible. Therefore, it does not exist. <coughs> and I remember when I used to teach this to undergraduates at some point, someone used to say, but what if I promise never to run programs on themselves? Or what if I promise never to write programs that take other programs as inputs? I, I won't do compilers. It doesn't help. You can always make a, you know, put a disguise on this phenomenon. So the timing problem, for example, is really just a halting problem or the non-halting problem in disguise. So that's uh, another dwarf on the shoulders of a giant. And now I'd like to um, start getting really into those three topics that I, that I mentioned. So the first is computability over finite structures. So this work was done with Ashok Chandra. Um, another homework assignment is to figure out who is Chandra and who is me in this, in this picture. Um, 
um, this was this was done in the late 1970s. Uh, and so what I'm going to do here, I think I'm sure you've seen you've seen the slides uh, once before. I, I just scanned the original slides from the conference in 1979 where we talked about this uh, this result. Um, it's couched in the uh, lingua franca of of relational databases, um, um, and the title of the paper was about relational databases, but it's really about structures in general, um, graphs, databases, essentially anything uh, with structure. And uh, what I'd like to say upstart is that the way I like to view this uh, this work is it's uh, I think a natural um, uh, extension of the classic Turing Church computability from numbers or words, which is which are the creatures that. Uh, uh, were really uh, um, the ones appearing in most of the papers at the time uh, to general structures. And what the task I'm going to take upon myself here is first to convince you that there's some interesting issue here at all, and to give you the result without without the proof, and I will go. On. So the, the the first slide in that uh, talk was a big fat computer, and there were two examples of queries here that you ask the computer. Give me the names of all managers with IDs starting with six, first names starting with S, who make over thirty thousand dollars a year, and the second is give me the names of all managers whose ID number is the girdle number of a true sentence of first order arithmetic for whatever that means. And I, I won't really explain this picture, but as I said, this was couched in terms of relational databases. You have a finite domain in some relations. This is what it looks like symbolically. And here, don't even read this, uh, here was our attempt at the time on a slide to make a distinction between queries that are reasonable and they're okay and ones that are not. Instead of reading this, let me take you through a, a non uh, a, a PowerPoint uh, example of what I mean. So, so a structure, an example of a simple structure is a graph, a graph a finite set of points, some of them connected by edges. So it's really a binary relation on some finite set. And let's say this is our graph. I've drawn it here in some nice symmetric way, but the, the geometry is not part of the structure, of course. It's, it's just the points and, and their connections. Now, suppose we have a function that we want to compute, and that function does things to graphs, takes graphs and give you, gives you other graphs as a result. And suppose this particular function, what it does when it's given this graph, it gives this graph as a result. So you want to think of it operationally, it removes this edge and this edge, and then it removes uh, whatever it is, this edge and that edge and, and so on, and this is the result. Again, the fact that it's splayed out geometrically in this pretty way is not is not a point at all. This is okay. Should say okay now. Okay. Now suppose that we have another function, and when that function is applied to this graph, it does not give this, but it gives this. Now I'd like to make a very strong uh, claim here, and the claim is that this is not okay at all. And um, uh, does anyone want to say in the simplest words why, why, why is there something inherently wrong with this function, regardless of what it does on other inputs? Symmetry. symmetry. Yeah, but who said you need symmetry? I mean, uh, you're right. It's a function of the graph. Mm -hmm. Okay. Of, but not the name of the labels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you're saying the right thing. The way I like to say this is even simpler. This function, again, whatever it does on other graphs, what it's doing here is it's using information that does not appear, is not part of the original input. There's nothing in the input that says, this is what you both meant, there's nothing in the input that says that these three nodes up here are better citizens or worse citizens or different citizens from these three down there. So there's no, there's no, uh, uh, the, the function does not have permission to make a distinction between these three. No. This is the, the non-mathematical way of saying what's wrong with this function. And so the minute you go from words and symbols or a Turing machine tape to a structure like this, you have to be careful not to allow your functions to do this kind of foilish thing, as we would say. This is wrong. If we change the structure just a little bit and remove these three edges, then you can guess that we've given some, we've made some difference. So, so in that case, this will be fine. So how do we capture this mathematically? You, you hinted at, at this. Um, and so this is the way we did it then. We defined a computable query, if you want, a recursive or computable function on structures, uh, which has to have two properties. One, it's partial recursive, meaning it's computable a Turing. Um, and the second thing is the most important thing. 
uh, we called it consistency, it was later called by other people generosity, um, the function has to pre preserve isomorphisms or automorphisms, if you want, which is, which is quite enough. Uh, so if you have your structure and you have your query that gives the result of Q applied to this, uh, this structure B, um, and you have a, a, an automorphism or an isomorphism going from B to B prime, then this has to be isomorphic uh, too. Now, so you might say, okay, fine. So, so we need your functions to be computable and we need them to preserve symmetries, automorphisms, isomorphisms, any way you want to define it. Uh, are there other things that we want to restrict these functions in order to obtain the most general notion of computability on structures, which is what Turing and Church and others did for, for numbers and, and words, and non-structural uh, entities. And the only way that you would think of um, uh, convincing someone that this is enough is by doing what? Is by coming up with a language that computes exactly these, but which is an effective language, like Turing machine. And then, if there's no argument that this language is something we can implement and use, then we don't need any more restrictions. So the question that arises, uh, and this is the question we asked in our 1979 paper, is there a complete language for computable queries? So we want the analog of Turing machines or lambda calculus or Pascal running on a, on a Microsoft uh, Windows or whatever with enough memory and time. And this raises the question of what's the problem? Why shouldn't we simply take Turing machines <coughs> and restrict them to preserve isomorphisms? Just throw away the ones that give these bad results. Why is this not a good answer to the question? You can't tell whether. Yes, you can't tell. How do you know that we can't tell whether a program is in a language or not? Rice is still. So the language, the syntax of the language is non-computable by Rice is still. You can't tell whether a Turing machine or a Pascal program or a Java program uh, uh, preserves isomorphisms. Therefore, this is not a language. A language has to be effective. So again, the question is, can you find an effective language? And that's what we did, uh, uh, Ashok and I, in our, in our first paper. Um, and so we defined a language QL, query language, if you want. I'll, I'll explain very briefly. These are the three very funny operations here. And then we have while and composition and assignment statements. Um, uh, we, have, uh, we have equality, so we can uh, take the finite domain that's in the input and give a binary relation that gives just pairs of equal elements. Assignments, while, go, and so on. Intersection of relations, complement of relations uh, relative to the domain, to the appropriate power. And the three funny operating operations, uh, one of them throws the leftmost column of the relation out. So it projects on the last n minus one columns, if there are any. Uh, this is down arrow, up arrow, multiplies Cartesian product on the right by the domain. So you get a, a relation with an additional column. And uh, E twiddle takes the last two columns and twiddles them around. This is, this is the language we defined at the beginning. The first is a, is a technical result. We show that all the elements of this language are necessary within the framework of the language. If you throw away any of the features, you get a weaker language. But this is not interesting. This is interesting. That is, this is a very simple relational language. <coughs> For those who are in, uh, know about databases, this is really the closure under unbounded loops. Uh, of relational algebra, or if you want, first order relational calculus with an iteration operator. Um, and the hard part of the proof, of course, uh, is not to show that you cannot do anything bad in this language. That's easy because all the operations and all the constructs preserve isomorphisms. The hard part is to show, I'm going to skip this stuff. This is part of the proof. The hard stuff is, uh, the hard part is to show that given any function on sets of relations, which is computable a la Turing and preserves isomorphism, you can program it, program it in this language. These are the steps of the proof, and the hard part is to show how you can compute a relation that captures the set of automorphisms of the input relation in one big fat relation, then you use that to prove the theory. And that was the closing slide of that particular talk. Now I want to take a two minute, how long uh, practically do I have uh, started um, with is, so it, is, is 12 30 is, okay? Mm -hmm. 12 30 okay? Yeah, well, maybe five minutes before. We have time after after the discussion. Yeah, yeah okay. But uh, 12 30 is last. So I just want to uh, I take finish a, five minutes before. Okay. I'll, I'll take a little uh, detour. The following year, uh, uh, we published another paper on the complexity theory of, uh, of functions on, over finite relations, or if you want, the complexity of queries over finite uh, databases. 
Um, and the closing slide of that talk was the following, with some open problems. At the time, these two were, were, were solved, and I want to point to one of them in particular. We asked whether there is an effective enumeration of QP time. QP time are these functions that we just talked about, functions that are computable and preserved as amorphisms, generic, uh, if you want to call them consistent, um, symmetric, you might call them that, but they are computable in polynomial time in the size of the input, which is the, the structure itself. And asking for an effective enumeration is really asking whether the set QP time is recursively enumerable. Another <coughs> way of putting this, which uh, Yuri uh, uh, promoted uh, 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 in the following years, which is a nice way of putting this, is is there a logic or a language that captures polynomial time functions on finite structures? The way this is phrased here is exactly the same thing. Being RE means you have a language that generates uh, the syntax, um, and, and the structures are not necessarily ordered. Moshe and others, and Yuri and others, did a lot of work on the case where the structures are ordered, but we concentrated uh, in, in this early paper on the non ordered structures. And what I'd like to say here is this problem is still open. Um, is QP time uh, RE? Is there a language for polynomial time queries or the structures? And I think it's fair to say maybe Yuri Moshe can, can, uh, uh, can contradict me if it's a little exaggerated. It, it is considered maybe one of the, maybe the central open problem in finite model theory and descriptive complexity, and still open. Um, just very briefly, in some years later, with Tirza Hirst, who was a PhD student of mine, and now is in the... Machon Tal. Machon... Tal. Tal. Machon Tal, yeah, yeah. In Jerusalem, uh, her PhD thesis was computability over infinite recursive structures. Just briefly, if you have a structure that's infinite, it still can be computable in the sense that you, for example, a graph. An infinite graph is computable if it's a graph over the natural numbers, say. The nodes are zero to infinity. And to tell whether i and j are connected, you have a Turing machine and you have a program. So you can, you can tell whether uh, an edge is in or not. And we obtained several results, including a completeness uh, result in, in the style of the, of the uh, uh, theorem I just showed you for an appropriately restricted class of infinite recursive structures. And then uh, over the years, I, I did quite a bit of work on high non-solvability. Uh, this means that we talk about problems that are not just undecidable, that are highly undecidable. I have to explain that briefly and then give you uh, a couple of examples. So we already saw, even here in this short lecture, we saw the halting problem. We saw the snake domino problem on the half plane or on the plane minus a point. Um, and we saw the unbounded Italian problem. I'm sorry, the snake domino problem on the half plane is undecidable. So these three problems are undecidable. And in a sense, uh, for those who are picky, we take the negation of this, the non halting problem here. These are computationally equivalent, which means in the sense of the reduction. Huh? They're, they're not solvable, but they are equivalent for those who are not familiar with this kind of uh, thinking. They're equivalent in the sense that if you give me an, imagine, an imaginary solution to one of them, so God promises every morning to give me answers to questions about snakes in the half plane, I can use those answers to solve questions about halting and vice versa. So in that sense, these are equivalent. <coughs> but there are problems that are much, much worse. And I love this part where I talk to general auditors because people say, what do you mean? What can be worse than something that has no solution? And it can be worse in the sense that even if you give me one of these kinds of problems for free, I still cannot solve the other, although both of them are not solvable in the absolute sense. So another result uh, that, that, that I like is, uh, is the following. So you're given your set of tiles, finite set of tile types that you find in this guy's store in Talpiot, uh, and, and you point to a particular one of these finite sets of tile types. And you ask the same question, can T tile the infinite, not the infinite world, the infinite <laughs> plane in all directions, but there's an additional little pedantic Matzben restriction, which is I would like D to occur infinitely often in the time. The reason this just sounds pedantic is because if you have a finite set of tile types and they can tile the infinite plane, some of these have to occur infinitely often. But I'm a... I, I, I insist I'd like this one to occur infinitely often. And what does this do to the problem? It's still undecidable, but it's much, much, much worse than the general problem. So for example, if uh, you, can, you can solve the unbounded problem using the, the recurring problem, but you cannot 
this x has to be down there. But you cannot solve it the other way around. And in fact, this picture, by the way, large parts of its structure are due to Stephen Cleaney uh, several years after Church and Turing. So this is the line we had earlier where things are computable, decidable. This is the line where things are non-computable, undecidable. But there are several very interesting ways of structuring the undecidable uh, space of undecidable problems. One of them is to ha there are two interesting hierarchies here, the arithmetical hierarchy, the analytical hierarchy. You don't need to know the details of these if you're not familiar with it, except to say that the, cli the, high, the climber you high, the higher you climb in this hierarchy, you get more complicated problems that are not solvable by any of the problems below it given for free, so you get harder and harder unsolvability. After infinitely many classes here, there's another hierarchy called the analytic hierarchy where the same kind of thing happens. There's a very natural, so the problems we've seen, dominoes, uh, uh, tiling, equivalents, snakes, halting are all low down in the arithmetic hierarchy, very close to the borderline between solvable and non-solvable. There's a very interesting area uh, in this uh, uh, higher um, um, hierarchy which is called the sigma 1 1 pi 1 1 level of undecidability which as I said is infinitely more difficult than the levels uh, below it but it turns out some very very natural problems in computer science fall there and I, Bavonotai, spent some time trying to nail some problems as being exactly in that area and one of them is the recurring tiling the, so just the restriction that you want this particular tile to occur infinitely often takes the problem from being very low here to be in the bottom level of the analytical hierarchy and therefore infinitely many are. And other things are unbounded and fair halting. So Turin's halting problem just asked about whether, whether a program halts. There's something called fair halting where you want the program to halt as long as it's being fair to the resources, say the printers and the, the use of uh, resources. Uh, and there's uh, unbounded halting where there's non-determinism uh, infinitely branching. Uh, these are not too difficult to show uh, this, is, this is due to Cleany uh, in principle, this is a little different. Uh, many uh, results on satisfiability of certain kinds of dynamic logics and temporal logics and, uh, and others. Uh, we had some results together on this, Moshe, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, over the years. Uh, recurring tiles, dominoes, I, I mentioned this. And I'm going to end this talk by proving to you the last theorem I proved on my own in theory in 1991. And I, I'd like to show you this because it's not an earth-shaking result. It doesn't change the world at all, but I think uh, the proof is, uh, is cute. It's a kind of blackboard-style uh, proof, and I'd like to show this to you. And that's you, say, you say it's not earth-shaking. Is it by chance that it's the year when Soviet Union collapsed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In 1991. <laughs> sure. So I'm going to explain the problem and, uh, and, and prove it to you. So again, these are slides from uh, 1991. I think, uh, if I remember correctly, the Jew, uh, the, uh, the, 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 yeah. So I'm mentioning this because the Israel Journal of Mathematics actually has uh, has its roots in, on this campus, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I'm running it. Oh, great! I think <laughs> and this and this is the first year I worked for the journal. But was it Alex Lubotsky who did the? He uh, was the editor in chief, and I worked, so and he brought me to the I, journal, I, I see. and I handled this paper. Yeah. You handle this paper? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. So I'm going to show you the mistake in the proof now. So <laughs> we can still reject. <laughs> so this is the result. It appeared first in a, in a stock conference. Detecting Hamiltonicity on recursive graphs is sigma 1 and complete, so it's highly undecided. So I have to explain some things here. Let's see if there's enough here to explain them with the slide. I will, otherwise I'll... Uh, okay. It, it holds for all kinds of cases, but what do we mean here? So. Um, let, me, let me first tell you what a recursive graph is. So I said this earlier, a recursive graph, without loss of generality, uh, the set of nodes can be assumed to be the natural numbers. So you have a node number zero, node number one, and so on, infinitely many nodes. A recursive graph, all it means is you have an algorithm that tells you whether i is connected to j. So it's a computable infinite graph. And I'm going to talk about undirected graphs where there's no directionality of the edges, and talk about one more path. A Hamiltonian path in a graph, you all know what that is. A Hamiltonian path is a path that touches each of the nodes exactly once. In a finite path, you have to go through the nodes without missing any one of them and without um, uh, reaching any node more than once. And in an infinite graph, it's the same thing, except the path has to be infinite because it has to go through all these uh, 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 omega zero 
nodes uh, in whatever order. Uh, don't ask me questions about whether the path itself is computable or non-computable. That's not the issue here. And don't even look at this picture yet. Um, what did I have down here I wanted to say? OK, it's not here. So it was known at the time in, uh, in, in, the, in the 1991 or 1990 that the problem was undecided. This is very easy to show. That detecting whether an infinite graph has a, has a, uh, uh, has a Hamiltonian path is undecidable. But we don't know whether it's very low down, whether it's like the halting problem or, or the tiling problem, or whether it, it isn't. And the result here says it, it isn't. Meaning it's highly undecidable. It's on the lower level of the analytic hierarchy. Now, the quintessential problem that defines that level in the analytic hierarchy uh, is due to Kleene. This is like the the uh, uh, satisfiability for MP completeness. The 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 uh, the essentially the definition of sigma one one pi one one can be given in terms of the question of whether an infinite recursive tree has an infinite path. So you have a tree whose branching can be can be infinite, countable in infinite at each node, and so it can be binary, it can be ternary, it can be it can have uh, omega zero. Uh, 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 descendants each uh, each node, uh, and the question of whether it has an infinite path or not, whether it does have an infinite path is what we call sigma one one uh, complete, and whether there's no infinite path is pi one one. This is the classical problem, and to show that uh, that uh, uh, Hamiltonicity in graphs is sigma one one hard, one of the things that you might want to do is to carry out a reduction to and from this question of boundaries. And this is this is what uh, this is what I want to show. And, and the, the difficult part, um, uh, uh, we'll get to in a moment. So let me first show that it's sigma one, one hard. And the way to do that is assume we have a recursive tree. But the infinite trees, by the way, are recursive, the ones that define sigma one, one. Again, so you know uh, if, 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 a, if a node is the, uh, uh, is the um, offspring of, of a parent node, you can decide this. So assume we have a recursive tree T. And again, the set of nodes is the natural numbers. And let's just say without loss of generality that the node that's the root of the tree is zero. And we know that the question of whether this tree has an infinite path is sigma one one hard. What we want to do now is we want to construct a graph, a recursive graph. So everything I do here, you have to make sure that it's computable, given that the tree is computable, such that the new graph has a Hamiltonian path if and only if the tree has an infinite path. And this is the hard direction of the proof, is, uh, this is the, uh, the hardness. Being in sigma 1, 1 is easy. So here's the way I'm going to construct the graph. Don't ask me why yet, it will, it will all become clear in a few minutes. So we're going to construct this graph G sub T recursively. So everything is computable in the following way, such that, and I'll show you, it has a tree has an infinite path if this graph has a Hamiltonian path. So for each natural number n, we're going to build a cluster of nodes, five nodes, this is the cluster N, in the following way. Leading from this, from this node up is going to lead to the cluster of the parent of that node in the tree T. If it doesn't have a parent, so this, this is a stump. Okay? Down here, we lead to all the immediate offspring, immediate offspring, sons and daughters of the node N in the original tree. So essentially, if you put your hand over this, this is just the tree. The black edges are just, just the tree. But for each of these numbers, for so each one, we have these five funny nodes. And we're going to have edges going from here to this little, little node over here, and then from here to here, from here to here, and from there to there. I drew, the, I drew, draw these in green just, just for the sake of the picture. That's the one part of the construction. The subtle part of the construction is the following. Take any one of these nodes. This is, this is the node for n. It's the cluster for n and define its shadow, Sn, to be the distance of n to the root of the tree in the tree. So if, this, if n is at level 15 of the tree, so S of, 50, uh, S of n is 15. And this is now node number 15, which occurs somewhere in our graph. We have it there. So we're just going to have two additional nodes, color them red, going from this funny node to this funny node over here, from this to this, these are undirected. That's it. This is the construction. And for the root, for zero, we just have a little stump here, which is some That's the construction. So again, we really have the tree. We take the tree. We magnify each node into these funny little clusters of five nodes with the green edges. And then for each node, we, we take, we compute. This is all recursive, remember. 
we can compute the distance to the root because the tree is recursive, so we climb up the tree, and we take the distance, we find the distance as the number of a particular node, we, drew the, we draw the two with it, just that's the construction. And now I'd like to claim, so this is what it looks like, I mean, I just for the sake of the conference, and I drew a complicated picture, you know, this goes over here, this is connected to these, that's the tree, and, and so on. And now let me do the if and only if. So the if is, if we know that the graph has a Hamiltonian path, how do we know that the, um, is that the first slide I wanted to show you? Given a Hamiltonian path, P, so I think I don't even have to show you the only if, yeah. Let me, let me just, the only if is trivial. The only if is, if the tree, um, if the tree, no, no, I'll, I'll do that. So we're given a Hamiltonian path P and GT, and I want to show you that there is an infinite path in T. Okay? So what is a Hamiltonian path in an infinite graph? There's only one node that's at the beginning of, of the graph that has no parents, and that's this. We're going to start the path from here, and we know that there is a path that goes through all the nodes. How do we know that there is an infinite path uh, in the tree? Now, Hamiltonian path, except for this single starting node, each node in this graph contributes exactly two edges to the Hamiltonian path, because you have to go through that node, you have to go through that node once. So you have to come from somewhere and go somewhere. So this edge is definitely in the Hamiltonian path, because it's the only edge coming out of this one, and this is the start. And now comes the main, the main lemma here. The main lemma is, for any cluster, I claim if this edge is in the Hamiltonian path, I'm sorry, if, yeah, if this edge is in the Hamiltonian path, then one of these edges also ha has to be in the Hamiltonian path. And if I've proved this, I'm finished, because then there's an infinite path in the tree, because we start here, and by induction, if this is in the path, so for example, one of these is in the path, if this is in the path, then one of the ones below it, and you, you just choose one by the axiom of choice or whatever, and you get an infinite path. So now we're just left with a tiny little combinatorial issue, which is, if this is in, if for any node, if this is in the Hamiltonian path, this has to be uh, two. And the way that's done is as follows. Uh, don't look at the scribbling. This is our node, has an edge coming from the top, which we assume is in the path, and we want to show that at least one of these is in the path. And then we have these funny edges with the red, the red things going to these shadows and pre-shadows and so on. We have a little node over here. This little node is not connected to anyone except, except these, t these two nodes over here. So both of these edges have to be in the Hamiltonian path, if it's a Hamiltonian path. If both of these edges are there, then we have this is in the path, and this is in the path. So we've covered the two edges for this node. There cannot be another edge adjacent to this node in the Hamiltonian path. So this is not in the Hamiltonian path. If this is not in the Hamiltonian path, we need two edges for this node. Well, the only edges it has are one green and all these black ones. So at least one of the black ones has to be in the graph, and that's the end of the proof. I think one of the slides is simply hidden here because I wanted to go the other direction. Let me just make sure I didn't really erase it, and it's, it should be there. Yeah, here we are. I think I, I, by mistake, hit three slides. So let me uh, have a sec here. <coughs> OK. A couple of things here I missed, sorry. I wanted to give a definition of recursive graphs, which was for some reason hidden, uh, give you the result that it's undecidable, give you the definition of a Hamiltonian path. We did all that already. Um, um, okay. This is the definition of the graph. This is the definition of the graph. Ah, so this is what we missed. Yeah. So the only if part is if someone promises me that there's an infinite path P and T, how, how do I get a Hamiltonian path in the graph? This is it's not a trivial thing to think about, because all you know is that there's an infinite path going from the top to infinitely deep in the tree. 
who the hell knows how to get through all the other nuts. But the way we do this, I'm going to actually tell you how the Hamiltonian path runs. And it runs as follows. We imitate this infinite path in the trees. So the black is the infinite path in the tree. Remember, the black edges really are a capture of the tree. <coughs> um, whenever we visit a node, we do one of two things, depending on whether this node is in the path or not. So this node is in the path, right? This is our path that we're assumed to exist. If it's in the path, all, all I do, I, I go down here, cut across, cut to the left, cut down, and continue doing. So I've covered all the five little nodes of this cluster, right? The issue is with the, the nodes, these clusters which are not along this infinite path. What do I do with them? Well, what I do is, whenever I reach one of these nodes as a shadow of a node that exists, I go down here, instead of coming to the left like here, I cut across to this node, go up, down, up to the left, back, and down there. And so I cover all the clusters, all the nodes within this cluster too. How can I be sure that I've covered all the clusters in the graph? And, so, and this, by the way, I'm going to claim is a Hamiltonian path. If only I can convince you that any node that's not along the path is at some point reached by, as a shadow, and taken care of. Why is that true? Because the definition of a shadow is the distance to the root. So we have a shadow for each distance. Each number is the shadow of something. So give me node number 1073. It doesn't happen to be in the, in, in the infinite path, but it is the shadow of the node along this path which is at level 1073. So we, when we reach level 1073, the shadow of that, which happens not to be in the path, we will cut across, deal with it, and come back again. That's the end of the proof. Okay, so if you're wondering why this funny definition of the shadow being the distance is because we want to make sure that any node that does not happen along the infinite path in the tree, we can reach it simply by going to the shadow node and coming back again. And the funny construction here of these five nodes is just so we can go this way if we want to, this way if we want to, and this little extra node there here is for the other side of the proof where we need to uh, uh, a certain um, um, Pinata, I'm finished, I'm finished, I'm finished. So a lot of these things appear in, in these books. And, and, uh, maybe just one more sentence. Um, um, so maybe you can sense that I'm happy to talk about this stuff. I don't have the opportunity anymore. But, uh, but I really want to emphasize that, um, that every one of these, of these things uh, is, is you, you have Turing uh, in the background. I had Turing in the background all the time. The diagonalization arguments, the notion of reduction, the notion of, uh, of what can and cannot be computed, and so we'll owe him great debt. Take a break now. We have uh, the people who can have lunching privileges.